Good morning, everybody. Welcome here. Happy Easter. He is risen. We're going to rise, stand, and sing and worship the Lord. The King of all creation set aside his crown, a servant to the Father's love, descended from his throne above, author of salvation, giver of new life, crucified to pay for sin, our righteousness is in the name of with us. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. If we've not yet met, my name is Christian. I am the lead pastor here, and this is the one day out of the year when I willingly wear a tie. So um, you, get to, you get to partake in that uh, rarity. So again, welcome. We are we're thrilled that you're with us. This is a, a big day. We are excited to get to worship Jesus today. And I want to just mention a few things as we get started, we're going to continue to sing. We'll learn together. Um, but when you came in, hopefully you got a name tag. That just helps us make it easy to have real conversations. You're not sitting there wondering, 
who am I talking to again? So that, that's meant to put you at ease. That, that hopefully that does that. I know it's maybe a different than some other spots, but uh, that's our intention with that. And then hopefully when you came in, you got a program. And inside of there, you'll see a spot to take notes during the message. Um, you'll also see what's coming up is Maker Camp. We're really excited about this the first week in June. Uh, this is for kids K through 8th grade. Uh, going to be a great time. And registration opens t- basically today. And so you are welcome to go and begin registering for that. Um, we'd love for you to be a part of Maker Camp. And, uh, and then you'll see in front of you, there is this survey. And I'm not going to talk too much about it yet. I will talk about it later, but you're free to take a look at that. Uh, I'll talk more about that here in a bit. But inside that program, you can see a little bit of what's going on around the Grove, ways to get involved, get connected uh, in the days and weeks ahead. And we would love for that to be the case for each and every one of you. Um, and with that, I'm going to Go ahead and read our call to worship. So I gave you a little little pause, a little time to sit down, um, but go ahead and stand back up with me, and uh, we're going to read together. You can read with me Romans 6, 9 through 10. It says this, We know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Let's sing.
Lord Jesus, we worship and lift you high today because you are risen from the dead. You are no longer in the grave. You finished your work on the cross and you rose again to prove once and for all you are God. Help us today as we seek you. Receive our worship. May it be pleasing to you. Would you help us? Would you open our hearts, open our minds to the truth? And speak through Pastor Christian as he comes now. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So what are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing, I guess. Me too, kid. That scene is a, a turning point, really, in the movie The Incredibles, because it, it taps into and it summarizes Mr. Incredible's yearning for a certain kind of life. And his question to the kid, trike riding kid, that's what we're going to call him, uh, his question, what are you waiting for? I think it's very often uh, our question to ourselves. Right? What are we waiting for? And I think that trike riding kid, uh, his answer is ours as well. Right? If, we're, if we're honest, well, something amazing, I guess. Uh, amazing, it describes something that is full of wonder, right? It, it, something's amazing, that's the definition. It's filled with Wonder, And there's this whole genre that has developed in search of amazing, right? We have books like 50 Places, or I'm sorry, 50 Places, yes, to see before you die. Um, 100 Things to Do Before You Die. Even, you can do this specifically, 100 Things to Do in Missouri Before You Die. And 1,000 a, a Things to Eat, 1,000 Foods to Eat Before You Die you die, right? And there's, there's movies and there's, li I mean, not movies, but there's TV shows and there's, there's articles, all kinds of things in this genre, this new cottage industry of things to do before you die. And all kinds of these lists, they, they really, I think, suggest two things. One, we recognize that life is short. And two, we all think amazing is out there. There's something amazing to be experienced, to be tasted, to be seen. And so I find this fictional exchange between Mr. Incredible and trike riding kid and our actual search for amazing, especially insightful on Easter. I think it's especially relevant for Easter, right? Because people essentially ask, if you're talking about Easter, people essentially ask, well, so what are you waiting for? And our reply is usually, well, something amazing, I guess. I mean, and if we're honest, right, if you're a Christ follower, maybe you say, well, it shouldn't be that way. I should, yes, it's something amazing. But again, if we're honest, it's easy to grow numb to the wonder of Easter. And you wouldn't say it's not wonderful, it's not amazing, but, but you can kind of grow numb to the reality of it being so amazing. And, and furthermore, if you're here and you wouldn't call yourself a Christ follower, first off, again, welcome. We're really glad you're here. Um, and then, obviously, we have different commitments, right? You're here, and you have certain commitments, and, and maybe the majority of us, because this is a church, have a different commitment than you, but, but we can really acknowledge, I mean, just point blank acknowledge that it's one thing to, to try this exotic food or, or go to this, uh, this special dream location, right, on vacation in search of something, right? That, that's one thing. But it's something entirely different 
to orient your living around a Galilean peasant who lived thousands of years ago. Those are two very different things. So, so let's acknowledge that up front. And, and with that in mind, this desire for amazing and the difficulty that comes with our search for amazing, what I simply want to do today is present to you three amazing things, okay? three things that I think are amazing related to Jesus and Easter and Christianity. I'm going to go in the reverse order. So first, the amazing claim of Christianity is this. Okay? Very simply, it's this, that a Galilean peasant who lived 2,000 years ago was and is not only a long-predicted savior of humanity, he is God. That, that's what we believe. We've sung about it already. Walter prayed about it already. We believe that Jesus is God. We've been wrapping up, we're wrapping up today this series journeying through the Gospel of John. This is a, and we're looking at these signs, these miraculous acts that were done by Jesus, and they were meant to point us forward to an ultimate point, a greater reality. And we've been saying that for a number of weeks now. And at the end of the book, this man, John, who was a cousin of Jesus and one of his closest friends, he expresses just how amazing Jesus was. He says in John 20, 30, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. He says, there's plenty that I could tell you about. They're not written in this book. But then he goes on and he gives us this clear summary of the purpose of his writing. Okay, remember, this is a guy who knew Jesus firsthand and had known him for a long time. And he says, but these are written, right? These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now, almost two months ago, first message in this series, I... I went in more depth on those two terms, the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, th those two different terms. And, and so I'd encourage you, you can go back and check that out if you're inclined. But I, I put that in a nutshell here this morning. Right? John is telling us that Jesus is the Savior of humanity that had been predicted and awaited for millennia, okay? Not, not just decades, not just hundreds of years, but for thousands of years they'd been waiting for this Savior, but John is also telling us something else. He's telling us that Jesus is not simply a superman, right? He's not just a superman. And he's not merely a more incredible Mr. Incredible. He's not those things. Instead, he's telling us Jesus is God himself. Okay? I mean, he's putting Jesus in a completely different category. We, we, can't, we don't have that category except that he is God himself. So the amazing claim of Christianity is that the same being that spoke the universe into existence, he also cried in a crib in Bethlehem, Israel. And the claim of Christianity is that the one that made gravity, he actually was killed and buried in a grave. The one true ultimate most high God who gives each of us life and breath and all things, at a specific moment on that first Easter Sunday, he had his heart begin to beat again. And air once again filled his lungs. And he came back to life. That's the amazing claim of Christianity. And it leads us to the second amazing thing for us to see today. The amazing claim of Easter. Amazing claim of Christianity is that Jesus is both Savior and God, but the amazing claim of Easter is that when Jesus walked out of the grave, he demonstrated that he is uniquely qualified and supremely authorized to give life. For the last several weeks, we've summarized John's purpose in his gospel from John 20, 31 that we just read, and we said it's helping us believe that Jesus is uniquely qualified to give us life. He, he's been saying, look, this isn't something that anyone, just anyone can do. And so in our journey through the signs of John's gospel, we, we actually skipped a situation that some scholars describe as a sign. It happens really early in Jesus's ministry. And we skipped it because, I saved it for today, because it's actually Jesus pointing ahead to his resurrection. And so in John 2, Right after Jesus had turned water into wine, if you haven't read that one, go back and look at that, because that's pretty interesting. Okay, John 2, he turns water into wine at the wedding in Galilee. 
And we're told this in 2.13. It says the Jewish Passover was near. And so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves. And he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. So there's a few things you need to know about what's just happened in what we read. Okay, first off, the temple. Okay, they're at the temple. And the temple was the center of Jewish worship. It was viewed as the symbol of God's presence with his people. This was the place where proper worship was to take place. The second thing is we're told it's the Passover. And Passover is a time when Jewish people are celebrating God's past deliverance of them from slavery in Egypt. Okay, think Prince of Egypt, the cartoon, or, or you know, Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston. Okay, this is that exodus. It is, they're celebrating that God has brought them out of slavery in Egypt. Okay, now, it's also, because it's Passover, this is a time that is marked by animal sacrifices that are a part of and form of worship, okay? More explanation into why all of that. If you were here Friday, we, we saw some explanation of that on Good Friday. But, but to understand this then, sacrifices, bringing animals for sacrifices is part of this worship, and you had to come to this temple in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is up kind of on a mount. Okay, so there's, there's a journey. If you don't live there in Jerusalem, there's a journey to be made. And if you live far away... Bringing your animals can be very difficult. Another thing to know is depending on where you've come from, okay, because not all the, the Jews, all the people that wanted to worship uh, God were all living in this same place. Some of them lived in, in different provinces, different places with different currency. And so if you live in a different spot that has different currency, in order for you to operate for the week or the, the time that you're spending there in Jerusalem, in order to be there for that time, you've got to have money that works. And so we have these enterprising folks, entrepreneurs, who say, look, I see opportunity. And so they move in and they provide services, animals for sacrifice and a currency exchange. Makes a lot of sense. These things are, are very practical, very helpful for what is supposed to be going on in this time and in this place. And so then what's Jesus' response? Well, make no mistake, he is not happy, okay? He's not happy. Now, it's important to understand he's not whipping people, okay, but he uses a whip and he, he causes a stampede and drives these folks out of there and he makes it clear, this must stop. He's making it super clear. It has to stop. And we're going to look at a moment why Jesus is upset, but I want you to know it's not exactly because these services are being offered. It's not exactly what makes him upset is that the services are being offered. What makes him upset is how and where those services are being offered, okay? But first, how do you think this all went over with the Jewish leaders who, were authorized, who had authorized the commerce that was taking place here, right? How do you think they're responding or going to respond to Jesus coming in and upsetting this whole thing that they had going? Well, let's hear what happens. Verse 18 says, so the Jews replied to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? In essence, what they say is, how dare you? How dare you? What authority do you have to come in here and act like you have special responsibility for what's going on? You're acting like you're the Messiah or something. Like they think Jesus has a Messiah complex. He does. <laughs> so how does Jesus respond to the request for authority? How does he respond to this request? Say, show me your credentials. Give me your papers. Who are you to do this? Jesus responds, verse 19. Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. You want my authority? Destroy the temple. I'll raise it up. Their response, therefore the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build, and will you raise it up in three days? Now, as Jewish leaders here, they're essentially mocking Jesus at this point, right? They've been indignant. Now they're kind of mocking him. And, and they're doing that because, as we see so often in his exchanges with them, we've seen it numerous times over the last few weeks, their sights are set way too low. They think 
that he's talking about the magnificent building in whose shadow this whole deal was going down. It was a magnificent building. That's who they think, that's what they think he's talking about. But in fact, we're told, verse 20, or in verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. He's speaking about the temple of his body. Babe Ruth, though he died in 1948, He's still probably, I mean, I don't think there's much doubt about this. He's still the most famous baseball player to ever live, okay? There you see this artist rendering of, of the babe. And, and there are plenty of accomplishments to regard him for, okay? Lots of, of amazing accomplishments as far as baseball goes. But, but I think he's famous, perhaps, he's maybe most well-known for this story. Before hitting a home run with two strikes in the 1932 World Series, he, he pointed to center field like that picture shows. He points to center field. And, and the story goes, he, he's calling his shot, which turned out to be a home run over the center field wall. Now, it's an amazing story. It's awesome. And it's not true, okay? <laughs> it's just not true. I mean, as, as historians have looked into it, he did point, but he actually pointed, held up two fingers. He was, he was jawing back and forth with the pitcher and the bench that was giving him a hard time. There had been all this contention in the World Series up to that point. He's just pointing out, look, that's only two strikes. I still got one more. He wasn't actually pointing. He even said later, look, there's no way I would be foolish enough to do that in that moment. Okay? So it's a legend. But what Jesus has just done in this exchange with the Jewish leaders, three years before his death, he's calling a shot. It's no legend. He's calling his shot. He's predicting what is going to take place. He's providing the big point He's explaining what that first sign, turning the water into wine, and every other sign was pointing to. But the question then is, why here, in this particular place, at this particular time, and frankly, why should we care? I know, what's Easter? Yeah, you're talking Bible stuff. Sure, we should care, right? No, but really, why should we care about this, right? I mean, think about it. We're talking about a religious economic squabble that happened thousands of years ago and a half a world away. What does that have to do with us? Why should we pay any more attention to this than a Babe Ruth home run? What, what does this have to do with our concerns? We, we've got stuff to see and, and stuff to, to eat and do before we die, right? We've got hundreds and fifties and thousands of things, all these things that we need to do that are, that are amazing. What does this have to do with us in our search for amazing, why bother with this? Well, I think the answers to why here and now and why we should care, they're intertwined, and they're actually connected specifically to why Jesus is so upset. Okay? Again, there's nothing wrong with providing economic services. Jesus is not railing against entrepreneurship. Okay? So if you're a business owner, you've, been, you've done that, like he's not upset with you because you, you started a business. That's not what's going on. But what's happening is they are doing this in the temple, in this temple area, in such a way that dollars are the focus far more than God himself. And so providing a service is one thing. But what's happening here is they're jacking up prices knowing that they've got people who have traveled from far away and are now over a barrel having to decide if they can afford to be faithful. That's the problem, right? Again, providing a service is one thing. But that's something completely different. And furthermore, they've set this market up, not just, I mean, it says in the temple, but what, what we understand, historians would tell us, is that what, what they're not just doing this in the temple, but specifically they're doing it in the courtyard of the Gentiles. And, and this is an area that's outside the main temple courts. In fact, much of the temple, only, only the priests could go into. But there's a specific spot set aside, courtyard, that was meant to allow non-Jews to participate in the worship of God. And there's background to all of that, but, but just know there was this special place set aside for them. And, and the purpose here is to include all people, to let all the peoples, all the nations come and worship. But instead, these businesses have taken up residency in this spot, and thereby they are blocking access to these Gentile believers, these outsiders. And so, Jesus is hacked. He's hacked off because the place where all people were to come worship the one true God has become a place of exploitation and exclusion. That's why he's upset. And so if you have ever been left out for unjust reasons, 
If you've ever had someone take advantage of you, you should care about what Jesus is doing here. And if you have ever been guilty of excluding or exploiting someone else, then you should especially care about what Jesus is doing. See, the Bible explains this over and over again. This kind of exclusion and and exploitation is not the way God intends things to be. And this happens because we humans elevate ourselves above our maker, and we really try to do life on our own terms. And the result, the Bible tells us, is disaster. There may be amazing moments, amazing sights, amazing experiences, but ultimately, life apart from God is a dead end. And furthermore, it's not just bad for us. It's a heinous distortion of God's goodness. See, our rebellion is bad, not just because we become both victims and victimizers of unjust exploitation and exclusion, but it's bad because these things are are an affront to a God who is only good. He's only good. And so Jesus is overcome with zeal for his Father's house because he wants his Father honored, And because on God's terms, he wants us to experience the life that God originally intended for us. And so he famously tells us, John 3, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Despite declaring and demonstrating countless times that this was why he had come, eventually, real and lasting love that Jesus had come to to bring, that became too big of a threat. And so three years after calling his shot, Jesus was brutally tortured and executed on a Friday. He spent parts of three days, Friday, Saturday, and the, the early morning of Sunday in a tomb. And then on Sunday morning, he walked out of that grave. See, the amazing claim of Easter is that by doing so, he demonstrated that he is uniquely qualified and supremely authorized to give life. Which leads us to the third most amazing thing for you to see this morning. The amazing offer of Jesus. And it's this. A life of infinite potential is available to all of us. It's available to all of us. I want you to notice the aftermath of Jesus calling his shot and then delivering on that promise. John 2.22 it says, so when he was raised from the dead, this is, this is talking about later, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. They believed. This is what he meant. This is what it all pointed to. Life. Not around death, but through it. And they got it. Eventually. Eventually. But if you think it was simple and easy, even for these people who had spent years of their lives seeing firsthand Jesus' qualification and authority as the Savior, as God, then you'd be mistaken. See, after Jesus had risen, we're told that he eventually was seen by over 500 people. The Bible's not against facts. It provides a lot of detail. It's, It's not just this realm of philosophy. It's in the realm of history. So the claim is that he was seen alive by over 500 people, but initially he appeared to his closest disciples, though not all at once. John chapter 20, we're told this, but Thomas, called twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. You need to know, Thomas, Thomas was fiercely loyal to Jesus. 
We see this back in John 11 when Lazarus has died. He was fiercely loyal to Jesus. He's prepared to die for Jesus back early on when when most people were still trying to figure it out. But now he's distraught that Jesus is dead. And and here's the deal. He saw it all in its horrific detail. So he's not just going to jump on the belief bandwagon in some pitiful attempt to gloss over the devastation of what he's just experienced, okay? Let's just understand this. Thomas isn't about to just feel sentimental and now create a story to make him feel better about the loss of his friend. But John goes on and he tells us that a week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. See, in that moment, Jesus glimpsed, I mean, Thomas glimpsed Jesus' faithfulness in all its fullness. His loyalty was restored. But for Jesus, this was a moment not just for the faith of Thomas. This is a moment for each of us. Jesus responds. He says, because you've seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. See, the target of that statement is everyone who had come before and trusted God without seeing the Messiah and everyone who would come after the Messiah returned to heaven temporarily. Friends, you and I are not at a disadvantage because we haven't felt Jesus' side or, or, his, or, or put our fingers in his hands. No, he says we are blessed. Now, we can believe that Jesus is our creator. He is our savior and king. And instead of being excluded and exploited, we're invited to be adopted and addressed as royal heirs of an eternal kingdom. We can believe that Jesus is the sinless one who has died to pay the penalty for our sin. And instead of excluding or exploiting, we are called to a whole different kind of life. By believing we can have life through the one that is supremely authorized to give it. But what kind of life is it? So as we wrap up, I want you to hear and see what it means for us to receive Jesus' offer of life. And I think you'll find this explanation just better than anything I could do. So take a look at this video, and then I'll come back up. If you know very much about the story of the Bible, you've probably heard that Jesus offers eternal life. Sounds nice, but what does Jesus mean by eternal life. Well, Jesus adopted this phrase from the Hebrew scriptures. In English, it's translated eternal life or sometimes everlasting life, but the phrase literally translated from Hebrew is life unto the age. Life unto the age. What does that mean? Yeah, it's a dense phrase, and to understand it, we need to first talk about what an age is in the Bible. Let's do it. So the Hebrew word for age is olam, and it refers to a period of time. What length of time? Well, any length of time, actually. And it can be in the past or in the future. What matters is that it's a period of time with some common attribute that remains constant. So, for example? So, like the time of Abraham and his descendants all the way up to Moses. The common attribute is it's the time of Moses' ancestors. And so Moses can say, remember the days of the age, the years of past generations and elders. Okay. Or an age can be shorter and in the future. Like Samuel, who's going to spend his whole life serving in the temple. During his dedication, his mother Hannah calls this an age. So an age is a period of time that has a unique and constant characteristic. Exactly. And there can be all sorts of different ages, depending on what you want to focus on. You got it. And so someone could live in two ages at the same time if those ages happen to overlap. All right, so back to the phrase, life unto the age. What age is this talking about? Okay, so in the beginning of the biblical story, humans are made from the dust of the ground. 
This is a common biblical image for creatures that are mortal. That is, they live in an age where they could die. But God takes humanity and places them in a sacred garden where they're invited to experience a new and deeper kind of life. By eating from the tree of life. Yeah, we're told it offers them life unto the age, a life of infinite potential because it connects them to God's own divine life. But the story takes a turn. And instead of accepting life unto the age, they eat of the tree of knowing good and bad. Right. Taking from this tree means seizing life for themselves on their own terms, apart from God's wisdom. And so they're exiled from life unto the age, and they go into the age of death. They mistreat each other. They do what's right in their own eyes. Things get really violent. Exactly. And so the whole rest of the story of the Bible can be thought of as a choice between two different ages. The age of life on our own terms that leads to death, or the age of God's own life. And while humanity has rejected God's life, God promises he'll open the way back. Exactly. And it's that promise that ultimately leads the story to Jesus. He's presented as God's own life become human, so that both ages overlap in him. He lives in the age of mortality and death and in the age of eternal life at the same time. And so he can offer people access to life unto the age. Right. It's like what Jesus says in the Gospel of John. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Yet, just like humanity rejected God's life in the garden, Jesus was rejected and put to death. But God's life is more powerful than death. And so Jesus rises from the dead, and he can offer God's life to others. Like the Gospel of John also says, Whoever trusts in him will not perish, but has eternal life. That is, life unto the age. Cool. Now, most people think of eternal life as something that happens after you die. But in the Bible, access to this age is something I can have right now. Yeah, remember, Jesus was the place where the age of God's life meets the age of death. And that means that when people trust him, they can experience eternal life here and now. But we also still live in the age of death. So what happens when I die? Well, just like death couldn't overpower God's eternal life in Jesus, similarly, we can remain alive to God even if we're physically dead. In the Bible, this is called being with Christ. And it's not talked about very much because it's not how the overall biblical story ends. The focus of the Bible is about when the age of life completely overcomes the age of death. And those who are with Christ are recreated to share in God's eternal life. A world where the age of death no longer has any power. Exactly. Because life that is fully connected to God's own eternal life and love is a life that will never end. A life that never ends. A life of infinite possibilities. This is what Jesus is offering. But again, searching for amazing, that's a whole lot different than orienting your whole life around a Galilean peasant who lived 2,000 years ago. And so I want, I've invited the band to come back up, and, and they're going to lead us in a song that poses a simple but profound question. Is he worthy? And as they sing, you can feel free to join in or, or feel free to simply listen and consider. Is he worthy? And so we're going to sing, and I'll come back up for uh, a couple more things after the song. Let's sing together. to join with us as we sing. There will be some words on the screen in parentheses. So. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? groaning it is 
Life is short, and amazing is out there, and we believe that the, amazing, the most amazing thing of all is that Jesus is worthy. He is God himself, he has come to save us, and he offers us life, and I would be remiss to not give each and every person here the same opportunity that someone gave me when I was a high school student who thought that, well, my name's Christian, what else would I be? So today can be the day when you believe, when you agree with Thomas and say to Jesus, my Lord and my God. But for some, I understand that your response may still be, it's amazing, I guess. You're still not sure, and, and that's okay, and I want to invite you again, as others did for me, to learn, to continue to consider 
who Jesus is and what he's done and why it matters, why we would go to such great lengths to tell others that he is worthy. And, and here's the facts. You may be here today, and if you've decided, you know, Jesus just isn't for me, and thank you for being here. It, it really does. Uh, we really do appreciate that you would respectfully accept the invitation of your friend or family member and engage other ideas on foreign turf. I mean, that's not what we want it to seem like, but we get it. I understand it could feel that way. And so it, it means a great deal uh, to them, and it means a lot to us, to me and our church. Just thank you for being here. As I wrap up, I want to ask all of you to do something. Like I mentioned, it was this Easter survey, and, and I, you know, it's there and it put a nice pretty color on it. But uh, really, we would love for everybody to fill this out. So if you're, you're here all the time, we'd love for you to fill it out. Uh, if you need to update some information, that's fine. Um, real simple, just a few questions. Uh, as you see there, for everyone that participates, um, we're gonna, we, we give to these organizations that you see listed here already as a church. We're going to make a special donation on your behalf to one of our community partners. And so for every one that we collect, we'll, we'll just give to some of these really worthy causes here in our community. We'd love for you to fill that out. Um, fill, fill out what you're comfortable with. When you're done, you can put those in the offering box there as we make our way out a little bit. Um, we'll have some time where you could, you could do that. If you're comfortable, feel free to just put it back in the pocket. Nobody should be going around collecting them, but, but understand, if you just want to put them in that box, then we'll be sure to get them. Otherwise, we'll come by and, and grab them a little bit later. Um, but we're going to take a moment. We're going to play a little bit of music, really, literally 60 seconds, to give you some time. Let everybody fill these out. I'm going to fill mine out. I forgot my pen, um, but I'm going to fill mine out. And, uh, and I didn't tell you guys to bring one. Here, I got a pen. I didn't tell you, but you guys can do one later, okay? So... So they're going to disobey the, the rule here, or they're going to not do the thing, but, uh, but that's because they weren't given proper preparation. Um, but So go ahead, we're going to play the music, and if you would, we're going to fill these out together, and uh, then we'll continue. I'll, I'll come, we'll sing one last song. Um, when the music's done, I'll pray, and then we'll sing one last song. So, survey music. Sixty seconds. If you didn't finish, that's fine. But we can do a little bit later. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and we ask that your spirit of wisdom would reshape our vision with true hope, secure belonging, and his generous power. May you give us a fresh perspective, the kind of sight that can perceive and experience the eternal life that you offer us today. Amen. stand and sing. We're celebrating what Jesus has done. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met 
I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day things before we dismiss this time. First off, next week we're going to look at a man who was the most unlikely Christ follower in history, and he said he had found the secret to contentment. And so we're going to do this new series called The Search for Happiness. I uh, invite you to come be a part of that with us. Uh, we'll start next week, go through the end of May. Uh, it's a new series, which means here at the Grove there's donuts. So we're feeding you today. We're going to feed you next week too. Come back, enjoy some donuts, 
as we kick off a new series. We'd love for you to be with us for that. And then the last thing is, uh, it is it's kind of icky out there. It was beautiful yesterday, a little icky out there today, uh, but the egg hunts will go on, okay? So the way this is going to work, parents, we're not going to go over to the, the little park area that we were planning to, um, but instead the way this is going to work, parents, if you have kids who are downstairs in any of the, the kids' classrooms, if you would kind of make a beeline as soon as I'm done here, go make a beeline, go pick them up, pull them out of there, then what's going to happen is you can go find some food to eat, okay? We're just putting it on you. You got to pacify them for a little bit, okay? But what's going to happen is then the teachers are going to go into those rooms. They're going to hide a bunch of eggs really fast, about give us seven or so minutes, maybe seven to ten minutes. They'll hide a bunch of eggs, and then we're going to bring the kids back into their classrooms, uh, and they're going to go on egg hunt there, okay? So that was our, our compromise. The kids are still going to get lots of eggs and candy. I should mention, I, you have Maker Camp in there, okay? One kid's going to find an egg, a golden egg, and in that, uh, in that egg is going to be a free registration, a ticket for free registration to Maker Camp, okay? So that's also going on. We're giving away a registration to Maker Camp. Um, so that's what's happening. Enjoy more food. Drop those surveys in the box. Uh, with all that said, okay, I'm gonna, don't, don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. <laughs> Last thing, what we do, okay, got to do it because this is what we do. May the love of the Father, may the grace of Jesus, and may the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you now and until Jesus comes back. He's coming back, y'all. You guys have a fantastic week. Happy Easter. Let's go.